Hey Lord friends, Riot was kind enough to invite me to preview Valorant Protocol Agent 19, Neon, voiced by the talented Vanille Velasquez. During the preview, I was able to catch a glimpse at some new lore bits found on the range, featuring Killjoy, Yoru, and Astra. If you're not already, consider subscribing to stay up to date on Valorant lore. Let's dive in. Speculation inbound. Most of you have likely seen Neon's trailer by now, featuring scenes of her arrival to the Valorant Protocol's headquarters. I'll quickly go over the highlights. First of all, this is our first look at Valorant HQ. We are restricted to a hallway in Neon's room, but we can learn a few things from it regardless. You'll notice a number of Kingdom devices in the trailer, including the tablet set up for Neon with a message from Sage. We also see what is either a live feed or recording of Phoenix on a mission. I find this quite interesting. The thought of Phoenix in the middle of a firefight being broadcasted to the entire facility is really odd. We then watch a montage of her decorating her room. I can't speak to much of it, but a follower by the name of Kai was kind enough to send me a thread they made explaining each element of her room. I fear I'll chop up pronunciations, so I'll include a link down below. I also want to express how amazing it is that we get to learn about Filipino culture through the context of our favorite game. It's incredible what the Valorant team has done to ensure Neon feels authentic. I cannot commend it enough. At the end, we see Sage check up on Neon as she is settling in. She intends to bring her back to meet the rest of the team. It's possible to speculate from this and take Sage's role in her recruitment as a sign that Brimstone has granted her the lead role on the Radiant Training Program. Nothing concrete yet, but still something to consider. Oh look, Doggo. Comment pet to pet Neon's Doggo. Personally, I find this trailer to be the best one yet. It delivers on every front. Much love to the teams behind it. Okay, now let's get into what I managed to dig up from the preview event. Battle Pass lore is sparse this time around. No clear teasers for upcoming content. I did however want to point out that together for everybody. There are several Valentine's Day items in the past, so it fits thematically. But something about the design screams Cypher to me. It's definitely a reach, but I felt I should mention it. Now let's take a look at Neon's Tier 9 contract player card titled Eye of the Storm. In it we see a storm forming above a mountain range, with an orb interacting with the lightning. The foreground contains two figures standing in front of a police car looking over the scene. Speculating on this, I'm thinking the two figures are her parents. Not a ton of evidence to support that idea, but it feels right. Also, the Eye of the Storm reminds me of the rift above Sky's Forest in her announcement trailer. Her contract gun buddy also explains the device on her back, describing it as a surge protector. In her trailer, we can see her electric radiant abilities interact with electronic devices, such as with the hand scanner. I'm assuming this device keeps her powers under control to a degree. As for voice lines, I was only able to hear a handful by spamming custom games alone. This excludes interactions, unfortunately. Nothing major from what I did here, but you can listen to them through the link below. Later today, after the PvE goes live, I will have the interactions up as well. Oh, and here's a small tidbit shared with us during a dev interview. Neon's radiant powers are heavily influenced by her emotions. Now we can get into the real juicy stuff, the interactables in Brimstone's office on the range. First, we have this email from Astra. It reads, I'll be slipping away between missions for a while. There are consequences to building this bridge between worlds. I must see to those now, so that our ripples do not become waves. We will speak when I return. Be safe, Chale. Astra's responsibilities as an astral guardian unsurprisingly call on her to uphold the integrity of the universe. What surprises me, however, is the concern for consequences that should have already occurred. Omega presently has bridges between the worlds, so how does ours spawn new issues? And I imagine, for the sake of storytelling, those ripples will indeed become waves. Using her analogy, perhaps waves would open up bridges to worlds beyond that of the two Earths. I'm sure there's plenty out there to see beyond the central conflict. Let's move over to the cell phone which holds two new voicemails, one from Killjoy and one from Yoru. If you'd like to hear them in full, click on the link below to a separate video. Killjoy opens her voicemail by explaining that her and Neon have started work on rebooting the portal. She also praises Neon, despite her nervousness, and continues with a pretty significant lore bit. Neon's bioelectricity is enlaced with Earth's radiantite mesh. Killjoy exclaims, do you even know how crazy that is? It shouldn't even be possible. She begrudgingly admits that Chamber was right in recruiting Neon for their Alpha Omega bridge project. She finishes by stating that they are still working to stabilize the connection between the two Earths. With confidence, she assures they will get it done, and suggests that Brimstone begin planning what to do after. Yaru's message begins right after, with a howling cold wind flooding the background of the audio. He's in Icebox, seeking more answers regarding his lost ancestor. 
After searching the warship again, he exclaims that he found dimensional scarring on the sides of it. Yoru suggests that this means the warship didn't sail to Icebox from Japan. This makes sense, as the construction of the warship wouldn't have survived the trip. He follows this up with, If Kingdom discovered Radi Knight 10 years ago, why is my mask full of it? Yoru is certain there is more to find, and despite other missions, he affirms that he won't turn his back on it. He ends his message warning Brimstone that he too should not turn his back to it. We've long known Icebox confirms Radi Knight's existence in the distant past, so I'm curious where they plan to go with this. Lastly, we have the new main menu. Here we see Chamber, Brimstone, Neon, and Killjoy, who seems to be sporting different attire. Chamber's card has a teleporter shape on it, and Brimstone's bracer displays a hologram depicting the Alpha Omega bridge. Killjoy's bracer displays the same shape. At the end, Neon sends an arc of electricity at the coil above the portal, and right as it begins to form, the power is lost. This act does not bring with it a new map, so it makes sense that the bridge is not ready yet. If historical patterns are anything to go by, the end of this act will ramp up this part of the narrative as we enter Act 2. This begs the question, what will happen between then and now? It seems they are starting to open up other branches of the narrative, with Yoru and Astra. I'm excited to see where those go. That's all, Agents. As always, a massive thanks to my patrons and all of my subscribers for making this possible. And thank you again, Riot, for allowing me to come out and preview this content. If you're not already, follow me on Twitter to stay up to date with Valorant lore news as it happens. Also, check out our Discord server and become a part of the community. Links below. Until next time, take care, Agents.